Today, the uh, passage of Scripture that we're going to look at comes from Acts chapter 9 is where we're going to begin. And uh, I, I want you to know, I actually uh, had a different message prepared for this passage, which uh, I'm still going to preach a little of because my notes were really good, and I'm not, I'm not willing to just let them go like that, just so you're aware. Uh, but it's different than I intended. This is Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 1. It says, meanwhile, Saul, now Saul, if you're unfamiliar with scripture, his name is changed through this encounter to Paul, and he goes on to write the rest of what we refer to as the New Testament, because he travels all over the world planting churches and telling people about Jesus. So you're going to see his before, like we, we see his after in a little bit, but this is before. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, there was an exclamation point. Okay, you were like, wow, why'd you yell it? It wasn't like, God doesn't always like, Ananias, Ananias. Okay, you got it. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Today I want to talk to you not about the uh, heroes of our faith, not the people who we write about, not the names that we all know, but the people who help them get there and maybe more clearly to see our place in the story. Today, we're not talking about the guy, we're talking about the other guy. And the call for you today is to be the other guy. I like that, I thought that was fun. Okay, good. Church, you gonna help me preach today? Can we do this together? We are gonna have some fun? All right, grab a seat. We got work to do. So first, let me, let me give you the, the message that I had notes on, okay, that part. We have no ability to grasp the incredible nature of the transformation of Saul to Paul. We don't have categories for it. What happened in that man's life and what it changed in the world, I, I, I like came up with some categories, but they all felt insensitive. I was like, it's like Hitler started the Peace Corps. It's like Putin begins a chain of orphanages in Ukraine. And I, 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 I like wrote them down and I like wrote them down. I was like, I feel like a jerk. Like I feel really insensitive. And I want to be like, Kevin, there are real people. I'm like, I know that's my point. Like my point is we don't have a category for how transformative the transformation of Saul was. Saul was the leader of the group that their sole goal was to exterminate the early church, which they referred to as the way. 
I'm glad we gave that up because it sounds a little cultish. <laughs> They're like, where are you going? I'm going to the way. <laughs> what? <laughs> Sub- Sorry, there's subway jokes in there, but I was going to leave them go. <laughs> Don't do it to me. <laughs> I'm, having, I'm having a hard enough time as it is. <laughs> we don't have a category for how incredible it is, for how amazing it is. So Paul is terrorist number one to the early church, and then becomes the leader of that group. We're just like, what? I, I want to show you some examples of Paul in his own words of what he did. But first, a, a single scene. Um, we have this man, Stephen, who the Jews of that day, they drag out. And Stephen, while he is kind of on this sham trial, proclaims that Jesus is the Son of God. And then at the very end, he says, look, I see Jesus seated at the right hand of the heavenly Father. And it says they drag him out. They actually, they actually did this. This is how the text reads. It says, they held their hands over their ears and drug him out, which I want to be like, that's a little juvenile mob, like, right? <laughs> like they literally went, I see Jesus at the right hand of the Son of God. And they're like, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Let's kill him. But that's another story. And so they drag him out and they stone him to death. They throw rocks at him and pile rocks upon him until he would suffocate. And then this is what it says, kind of the key line in here. This is Acts chapter seven. I don't know exactly which verse it is. It's somewhere at the very end. Okay, so it says, meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And then the very start of chapter eight, verse one, It says, and Saul approved of their killing. And you may get this like wrong notion, they're like, okay, so like they they stone Stephen, they murder Stephen, and like Saul's like the coat guy? Like he's just like watching their coats? Like, no, 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 don't think coat guy, think mob boss. Okay, that's what's happening there. They're laying their coats and he's standing there in approval that they are murdering this man. And then we get a little bit of clue later on on the kind of person Saul was. This is uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 3. It says, but Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Paul literally went door to door to take people, to find them, to hunt them down. Like he, taking fathers from their families, taking mothers from the arms of their children. And then at the end of Acts, when Saul gives his own description, like in chapter eight, they describe Saul and they say, he sent them to prison, but then Paul confesses later in Acts chapter 22, verse four, he said, I persecuted the followers of this way to their death. He says, and I killed them. And and it's like, we, we don't really grasp This guy, because we're like, well, and then Saul was walking along the road to Damascus, and then he saw a really bright light and heard a voice, and he was radically converted. And there's this part that everyone would be like, we wouldn't buy it. Is that okay for me to say? Like, if it was Saul, if like, if you woke up this morning and the news said, hey, listen, everybody, uh, Putin has had a change of heart. He found Jesus. Would you be like, well, praise God. Or would you be like, I don't know. (laughs) Let's see how this goes. Like Saul isn't like coke guy. He's like mob boss. Like Saul is like the kind of guy, I don't know. Does anyone watch like crime movies, crime dramas? I know when you're not watching Touched by an Angel and The Chosen and all those other things. The the other time, okay? Your thug life. You're watching like some crime dramas, some stuff like that. Is that anybody? Okay, good. Uh, My wife, she uh, she loves murder books. Just, just a big fan of the homicide. <laughs> and uh, and I, uh, sometimes I'll ask her, I'll be like, what are you reading? And I can see, like, I can tell from the cover and the title, someone dies. <laughs> you go, what are you reading? And she'll go, research. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, there's always, there's always like in the, in the like crime drama, something like that, there's always the like spot in the story in which they need to call in the guy who's like 
in the shadows. You know what I'm talking about? Like they're like, oh, we need, we need them to be taken out. We can't do that. Let's call so-and-so. And they've always got like the burner phone and something like that, and they come in real creepy, and they're like, yeah, I can do that. And they're like, how? You don't want to know how. And they're like, I don't want to know how. You're right. Like, you know that guy, like that guy in the story? That's Saul. That is who he is. He's doing the dirty work that no one else wants to do in orchestrating all these things to exterminate the people who are the followers of Jesus. And God looks at him and goes, that's my guy. That's the guy I want. I imagine there's this uh, quick committee meeting of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's my guy. That guy? <laughs> Father, I know you're perfect in all your ways, but I think you missed. <laughs> like, like, not that guy. That's not the guy. He's like, no, no, that's my guy. We, we started this series a couple weeks ago, and we had this definition. We said that the definition of audacity is a willingness to take bold risks, but that the other side of audacity is absurdity, the quality or state of being ridiculous or wildly unreasonable. I feel like God is being ridiculous. Is that okay to say? I want Saul, too much, like it's too crazy, and yet that's who he uses. That's who he uses to transform the entire world. We are here today because of the work of Saul. Saul, you're here because of the terrorist who was trying to commit genocide is why you're here. That's who God used. And you thought he couldn't use you? Oh, come on, seriously. You thought he couldn't use you? How much genocide do you have in your life? How much homicide do you have in your life? Well, maybe don't answer that one just in case. Okay, we'll just steer clear of that one. But like, like this is who God uses. Like, and I always wanted people like, oh, God can't do this, God can't do that. I wanna be like, do you know the scripture at all? Like God uses Abraham who lies multiple times and says that his wife is actually his sister in order to save his own neck. Like, I've made some bad moves as a husband. I have yet to call Bethany my sister. <laughs> like, I'm doing good. Like, I'm doing good. Husbands, you're doing good. You're doing better than Abraham. And yet God uses Abraham in spite of that. God uses Noah who gets passed out drunk. He uses Noah. And I know every parent is like, like, if you've taken a long car ride with kids and you know how exhausting and terrible that is and you're yelling things at them, screaming, just, to, just be quiet, that's all I need. And you go, we cut Noah a little bit of slack because you're like, dude, you're on a boat with your family and animals for years. Like we go, we get the passed out drunk part. We're like, yeah, I can, I can kind of see that. But God uses Noah. He uses Noah. He uses Peter. Peter denies he knows Jesus to junior high girls. He is terrified of the junior high girls. Some of you know exactly what that's like. You're like, they scare me too. I don't know what's going on. Denies he knows Jesus, is walking on water, like Jesus enables him to walk on, we're gonna look at this next week, enables him to walk on water, and he gets scared of the wave and starts to sink. Peter, when Jesus is going to be crucified to give his life willingly, pulls out his sword and cuts off a soldier's ear. C can we be clear? He wasn't going for his ear. Like sometimes we say, like, oh, Peter cut off his ear. He was going for his head. He missed. Like this wasn't like, a, oh, you're taking my Lord and Savior. You can't hear out of one ear. Yeah. Enjoy coming out of your right side for the rest of your life. Good luck. He uses Peter. He uses Abraham, he uses Noah, he uses Saul. He can use you. Do you believe that? He can use you. And some of you look at it and you're just like, oh, but Kevin, you don't know what I've done. He can use you. He can use in the midst of your imperfections, in the midst of your failures, in the midst of your fall. You have a better history than Saul does. I promise you that, and he can still use you. Come on, Highland Park. Do you believe that today? He can use you no matter where you are. But this is the other thing that I know. You're not Saul. Because if you were, we'd be shocked that you were here. 
And I know some of you are thinking, like, listen, I, I was a little nervous coming in. Lightning, everything else. I get it. Man, I'm newer to Lakeland. Your thunderstorms come in in a hurry. I'm not going to lie. It makes me a little nervous at the time. But, but there's this, like, I don't know how this is going to go. Listen, if you were Saul, we would be shocked, every single one of us, that you walked in the doors. You're not Saul. But you might be the other guy. The guy who enables Saul to get to where he is. And so this word comes to this man by the name of Ananias, Acts chapter 9, verse 11. It says, the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. Now, if you're Ananias, you're going, whoa, whoa, whoa. Who? A man from Tarsus, because Tarsus was an important city. Tarsus was connected to all the trade routes. So like Tarsus was centralized in the first century world, that if you were in Tarsus, you knew how to get everywhere. You know everything that mattered, and you were connected to people. He goes, a man from Tarsus named Saul. Now, if I'm Ananias, I'm going, I think you got the wrong guy. <laughs> I think you meant someone else. He goes, no, 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 no. You're going to see a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying in a vision. Now, this is the part that gets me. Could I just acknowledge that? In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. He has seen a man named Ananias. Have you ever had someone obligate you to an event that you didn't want to go to, but they already told everyone you were going? <laughs> come on. My wife is uh, significantly more extroverted than I am. And so sometimes she's like, we're going. I'm like, we? <laughs> Got a mouse in your pocket, hun? Like, who's, <laughs> who's we? Yeah, no, we're going. I told him you'd come. I was like, you didn't ask. And I told him that you were thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> like, if I'm in an eye, there you go. You're going to go see Saul of Tarsus. All right. I told him Ananias is coming. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I didn't even get a chance. He says, a man named Ananias will come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. First, let's see what God does, okay? Verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and after a three-week class was baptized and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. First, can we give thanks to God for transformations like Saul, for the way in which God turns people around in a brand new way? Saul is transformed in a moment, but that's not the piece that blew me away, actually. Because I've read this a bunch of times, and I was prepped to preach the message on how God transforms people like Saul. And then there was this part that, oh, it just stuck out. Let me read it again, verse 17, just verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul. Ananias knew people who had been imprisoned and probably killed by Saul, new people, because he's connected. He gets word that he's got to go see Saul. Now, I, I got to ask you, like, how would you enter that situation? Like, what would you do? Send an email? <laughs> Give some notes? W well, could we just send Saul a message that, that I, I wanted to see him? No. Ananias walks in the room, and imagine you're Saul. Like, you see a bright light, you hear a voice that says, I am Jesus whom you've been persecuting, go to Damascus. That's all he's got. Like, that is all he is going on. And he gathers into a room, and he's been blind for three days. 
Imagine the terror that you would feel. You have no idea what's going to happen next in your life. You know you have now been persecuting the people who God has called, who he saved, and he's in a room by himself, three days, blind, has no idea what's going to happen next. And he hears the door open. He hears people greet Ananias. He hears some footsteps come his way. He feels two hands on him. He doesn't know if these are hands meant to heal or hands meant to destroy. And then he hears, Brother Saul. He is fully welcomed, fully embraced into the family of God. The terrorist is welcomed with open arms. To, here, here's the thing I know, you know how this feels. You know what it feels like to be out of place. <laughs> you ate lunch at middle school, okay? Can I just say it like that? You know what it feels like to not know if you fit in. And you know what it feels like when that one person reaches out and welcomes you in fully, welcomes you in warmly, and the difference that it makes in your life. See, here's my belief. My belief is the reason why we don't have more stories like Saul today is because there aren't more people like Ananias that, that will hear people, famous people or people that we know, and will hear that they gave their life to Jesus or they started following Jesus or they were interested in church, but we know their past. We know their history, and so we kind of sit back and we go, I don't know. Let's see how this plays out. And then because there's no one there to encourage, there's no one there to support, there's not a community there to rally, they fall back to their old life. And then the Christian people sit around and go, told you so. If we're going to have stories like Saul, we need people like Ananias. So here's my question for you. In the event of the uncomfortable call of God on your life, can you fully embrace what God is calling you to? Or will you always hold it at a distance? Can you fully embrace the difficult thing that God is leading you to? And when you hear call, I don't want you to think position, I want you to think person. Because God always calls us to people. He never calls us to things. It may feel like a thing, but there's a person behind it who deeply and dearly matters to our Heavenly Father. And when that comes in your life, will you stand at a distance? Will you make an excuse? Or can you walk in like Ananias does? Oh, let me, let me just say it like this. I have in moments in my life felt like I desperately needed an Ananias. And then I realized I'm not called to wait for an Ananias. I'm called to be an Ananias. I'm not called to wait for someone to welcome me in. I'm called to welcome others into the kingdom and what God is doing in this place. See, th this is what I know. Ready? You may not be able to teach. You may not be able to preach. Now, some of you may, you go, I, I can, and I could do it better than you. We'll talk about that later, okay? But you may not be able to. You may not be able to sing. You, you may not be able to organize, but you can say hello. You can say, would you like to get lunch? You can say, hey, I would love to hear your story and what you've been through and what you're going through and what God is doing in your life. And if you can do that, he can use you. He can use you through the open hand of a greeting, through the open hand of a welcoming is the very power of God in your life. If he can use Ananias, he can use you. If he can use Saul, he can use you. See, church, let me tell you this. Could I just say it simply like this, the kind of people that we're gonna be? We are a no stranger church. 
It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter what their background is. You go, we have nothing in common. You're in the same row. Congratulations. That's all you need. Walk up to them and say, what led you to this row? This is my favorite row. Isn't this a great seat? When we're down front, he yells at us and maybe spits at us in a little bit. In the way back, oh, this is the best seat ever. This is the kind of people that we're going to be. You can be the other guy. But while what Ananias does is extraordinary, it's actually not original. It's incredible, but he doesn't come up with it himself. Book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 8. I'll give you a second if you want to find it, because I don't want you to lose this one. Romans, chapter 5, verse 8, says this. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Before you even made a move towards God, he gave his life for you. Before you showed any evidence that you really got it right, he sacrificed himself for you. Before you even showed any affection towards our Heavenly Father, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Ananias is just walking in the footsteps of Jesus. He's just doing what God did for him. He's doing what God did for you. Church, would you stand with me in this moment? Band, I got one more scripture and one more story, okay? You can go ahead, make your way, come on. One more scripture, one more story. Let me show you the best thing. Not only is Ananias the other guy, but so is Paul. <laughs> So in 1 Corinthians, much later on, there's this argument and they're saying, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, two teachers of that day. And Paul responds to this argument. This is in 1 Corinthians starting chapter 3, verse 5. Paul goes, what after all is Apollos and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. Oh, we should celebrate that. It's God who's making it grow. And then look at this, oh, this last part, verse seven. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God. Turn to your neighbor, say, only God. He, he goes in this moment, he goes, listen, we don't really matter. Like we get to play this part. We get to participate in what God's doing, but we don't really matter, only God. So here's my last story. You can take this. I don't know who takes this. Je Jesse takes it. <laughs> Thanks, Jesse. <laughs> uh, so yesterday I'm hanging out at HP Sports, and uh, I got introduced to uh, someone who goes to another church, obviously a lesser church, church not as fun and everything else. So. <laughs> Sorry, these are just jokes. If you're coming in for another church, you got real nervous. You're like, wow. Um, and, and so I got introduced to this guy. And so we're just talking, background stuff like that. And he goes to me, he goes, uh, so I got introduced as the new pastor at Highland Park. And so after a while, he goes, well, what kind of a pastor are you? I thought that was like personality type at first. <laughs> I realized he meant position, but he's like, what kind of a pastor are you? And I just said, well, I'm the... I'm the senior pastor. And he goes, okay, so like different churches do it differently. Is that like an executive pastor? Is that I was like, well, what about me that you're looking at me makes you think that I couldn't possibly be the senior pastor here at this church? Like he was, I was introduced as the new pastor. I said I was the senior pastor. He's like, what kind of a, okay, so what's that? And, and I just said afterwards, I just said, I'm like 
I'm like the guy who speaks. I'm like the guy in charge. He's like, oh, you're the guy in charge. Got it. (laughs) And then I was convicted a moment later. Not in charge. Only God. Not my church. Not your church. It's his church. See, Ananias understands he's the other guy. Paul understands he's the other guy. The moment you embrace this understanding, I'm not the guy, it's Jesus. Only God. Come on, church, let's celebrate that today.